The 10th of May was an important date for Frenchmen in 1802. That day, a plebiscite, a kind of referendum or election, was held across France. On the ballot was the simple question as to whether or not Napoleon Bonaparte, who just a few years earlier had been proclaimed as first consul of France, should be granted that office for life. This would effectively make him the French head of state for the remainder of his days. The turnout was relatively low, with women and poor people not having the right to vote, despite the rhetoric of the French revolutionaries throughout the 1790s about equality and fraternity, while in addition of the 7 million men who were eligible to vote, only just over half decided to exercise the franchise. But the result was unequivocal. Over 99.7% of people voted yes, that they wanted Napoleon to become the French head of state for as long as he lived or decided to hold the office. Though some electoral fraud was doubtlessly a factor in this landslide victory, there is no doubting that Bonaparte would have won a clear victory in this plebiscite with or without vote rigging. Such was his popularity across France in the summer of 1802. Three months later, on the 2nd of August, 1802, the result of the plebiscite was made known publicly, and Napoleon Bonaparte was formally declared to be First Consul of France for life. As Napoleon settled into his now unrivaled position as head of the French state, he would have been conscious that France stood in a more favorable position in Europe than it had for many years. Just a few months earlier, peace had finally been agreed with Britain through the Treaty of Amiens, bringing war with the ancient enemy of the French to an end after a decade of conflict. Peace had also been extracted from the other great European powers, such as Austria, often at the major expense of France's enemies from a territorial perspective. With sister republics established as vassal states in the Low Countries, Switzerland and Northern Italy, the Batavian, Helvetic and Cisalpine republics respectively, and the west bank of the River Rhine under French control, France was the master of Western Europe. Furthermore, the unrest which had characterized France internally since the revolution in 1789 was largely at an end, and the economy was beginning to prosper, with a French envoy by the name of Louis-Guillaume Otto noting in 1799 that France was beginning to enter the Industrial Revolution, one of the first uses of the term in recorded history. This was the country which Napoleon was now undisputed ruler of. The question was whether he would seek peace to consolidate his and France's position, or would his restless energy and drive lead Bonaparte to engage in further wars of aggression? We have many descriptions available to us of the man who became first consul for life in 1802. Napoleon never struck one as a warrior. His height was average for the time, his frame thin, and his complexion bordering on delicate. His hair was shorter cropped now than it had been for anyone who had known him a decade earlier on Corsica or at Toulon in the early years of the revolution. However, there could be no denying his sense of purpose. Often, he would travel between government offices, his chambers, military barracks and other sites when in Paris, dictating letters at speed to his aides. His own handwriting was very poor and symptomatic of a restless mind. Those who spent much time at all with him in the early to mid-1800s would have noticed his penchant for snuff or powdered tobacco, which he frequently inhaled from a gold box before handing it back to a chamberlain. His expression could shift from one of deep thought to intense amusement, and his laugh was loud and coarse. Even as ruler of France, he never developed a strong sense of social snobbishness, and he could speak with ease with commoners and disarmed nobles and members of the upper class by not abiding by the social rigors of high nobility. It was possibly his common touch which ensured that Bonaparte was revered by the troops and generally entered military camps to rapturous applause. At home, Napoleon, who in 1802 began signing all of his official correspondence simply as Napoleon, without his surname, much as a monarch would, had to deal with matters which must have seemed relatively pedestrian 
compared with his general activities in Italy and Egypt over the past several years, but which were nonetheless important. A poor harvest in 1801 had seen bread become scarce by 1802, and Napoleon was determined to take measures to keep prices from rising, aware that it was this very issue which had tipped the government of King Louis XVI into crisis in 1789. Funds were distributed from the central exchequer to finance soup kitchens and other charitable endeavours to ensure everyone in France was fed a basic minimum. Elsewhere, the new constitutional changes which had been agreed upon as part of the establishment of the consulate were implemented in the autumn of 1802. All adult males were to be given the right to vote for officials who would occupy offices in each department across the country. But while there was the surface pretense that republican norms were continuing, in reality, power was becoming ever more centralized in Napoleon's hands, and day-to-day -day governance of the country was managed by a privy council of Bonaparte's closest supporters and allies. While France was briefly at peace with all of the major European powers following the establishment of the Peace of Amiens with Britain, there were a number of areas where outstanding military concerns remained. Many of these lay overseas. There had been an international dimension to the French Revolutionary Wars since the early 1790s, owing to France having colonies overseas in North America, the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean, as well as a number of minor trading posts along the coasts of Africa and India. Generally speaking, France had been unable to retain control over these regions when the wars broke out, a development owing to the dominance of the seas by the British Royal Navy. For instance, in 1794, the British had invaded and occupied France's major sugar colony in the Caribbean, Guadeloupe, though in this instance, the French were able to reclaim the island some time later. Other French colonies had been almost entirely cut off from France for years. Others had descended into social unrest as the nature of colonial society was overthrown when the revolutionary government sent word in the early 1790s that slavery was to be abolished in line with Enlightenment principles. What is clear is that France's overseas territories were in various states of disarray by 1802. The establishment of peace in Europe for the first time in a decade now presented Napoleon with an opportunity to reorganize how these were managed and what their future relationship with France would be. The island of Hispaniola, which had long been divided into a French colony in the west and the Spanish settlement in the east, provides an instructive example of how Napoleon attempted to reassert French control over France's colonies in 1802 and 1803. The slave and native population had largely banded together here in the autumn of 1791 and overthrown the French colonial government. A freed slave by the name of Toussaint Louverture emerged as the leader of the newly independent state of Haiti, a state in which slavery was abolished, a development which the revolutionary government in Paris would not have been ideologically opposed to. The complicated nature of the Haitian Revolution is seen in the fact that many Frenchmen joined forces with the Haitian rebels to govern the new country over the next decade. It was only in the spring of 1802 that Napoleon was in a position to commence a campaign to reconquer the French half of the island. This initiated a guerrilla war and a shameful campaign of repression in which the French became one of the first nations to use chemical warfare by burning sulfur to make sulfur dioxide. By the summer, French control of Haiti seemed to have been reimposed, but then came the news that slavery was to be re-established, triggering a renewed war of resistance against the French. This was still underway in the mid-1800s when Britain and France ended up back at war with each other. With its naval access to the Caribbean once again severely impeded by the Royal Navy, the French could not maintain control of their section of Hispaniola, and in 1804, Haiti became an independent nation in a landmark moment 
in the history of colonial independence movements. If Bonaparte was determined in 1802 to restore French control over Haiti and other economically valuable sugar colonies in the Caribbean, he was less confident of France's ability to remain in possession of its vast territories on the North American mainland. As far back as the late 17th century, the French had started exploring and then settling the region around the mouth of the Mississippi River, where it flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Eventually, the town of New Orleans emerged here in the 18th century. The French penetrated further inland, the goal at the time being to establish a set of trading posts and settlements all the way up the Mississippi and Ohio rivers to the Great Lakes to meet France's other colony of New France in what is now Canada. The ultimate aim was to hem the British in to their colonies along the eastern seaboard of North America and prevent their further expansion to the west. However, France had lost New France to the British as part of the peace terms at the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763, and the British colonies had then established themselves as the independent United States of America in 1776. Moreover, much of the suzerainty of the Louisiana Territory had been granted to Spain in 1763, and the legal title to the region was a matter of dispute for much of the second half of the 18th century. As such, France's continental strategy was rendered null and void even before the French Revolution commenced. Though the French government still claimed a mass of territory in North America, stretching from New Orleans and Louisiana in the south, north towards the Great Plains and the lakes. In 1802, Napoleon was faced with the question of whether or not to continue to try to settle the Louisiana region. An agreement with Spain in 1800 had acknowledged France in its possession of the vast territory, but Napoleon viewed it as logistically impractical to focus on building up a major colony here, while he was aware that Thomas Jefferson, who became the third president of the United States in 1801, was anxious to acquire the territory of Louisiana to allow for America's further westward expansion. The French, for their part, were willing to countenance the American interest as they viewed the possibility of a US alliance with France as favorable for when a new war would break out with Britain. Accordingly, in 1802, negotiations were commenced between the governments of Jefferson and Napoleon, with a view to France selling its colonial holdings in North America to the United States government. The result, finalized in the summer of 1803, was the Louisiana Purchase, whereby the US government acquired over 2 million square kilometers of land from the French for a sum of $15 million, or roughly half a billion dollars in today's money. The transaction technically included the modern-day states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, the Dakotas, and parts of Montana, Colorado, and Wyoming. But in reality, French settlement was very limited in these regions, and the US government was actually trying to purchase land which was owned by the Native American peoples of the Great Plains, tribes such as the Sioux and Lakota Indians, which it would spend much of the 19th century fighting for actual possession of the region. More broadly, the Louisiana Purchase did not have the desired effect of bringing the US into the French camp during the Napoleonic Wars. And while the US and Britain did end up at war with each other, briefly from 1812 onwards, this was owing to distinct tensions between London and Washington, rather than any great desire within US political circles to aid the French. Napoleon did not just have to deal with problems in the Western Hemisphere in 1802 and 1803. There was unrest as well in some quarters in Europe. Back in 1798, in the early stages of the War of the Second Coalition, the French revolutionary government had overrun the Alps and had established the Helvetic Republic, in succession to the Swiss Confederacy as a sister republic and vassal state of France. However, the Swiss, who had been known since the medieval period for their proud independence and unwillingness to be dominated by any of their more powerful neighbors in the shape 
of France, Burgundy, Austria, or the Italian city-states, were never fully reconciled to French overlordship and had continued to wage a low-level guerrilla war against the French across the Alpine region throughout the late 1790s and early 1800s. This peaked in the second half of 1802, following the withdrawal of French troops, and the collaborationist government of the Republic was forced to seek refuge in the town of Lausanne on the French side of the Alps by the first weeks of 1803. Faced with this situation, Napoleon sent in a large French force under the control of a rising commander, General Michel Ney. With these, he succeeded in agreeing the act of mediation with the Swiss cantons in February 1803. Under the terms of this, the Helvetic Republic was abolished and the Swiss Confederacy was recreated, though with some important constitutional changes, which impacted on the hierarchy of the Swiss state down to the present day. In doing so, Napoleon rid himself of the problem of maintaining French control over the notoriously difficult Alpine territory, while also ensuring the Swiss remained largely neutral in the wider Napoleonic Wars, but also allowing French troops to pass through the region. These were tense times for Napoleon in other ways. The year and a half after his confirmation as First Consul for Life saw him survive numerous assassination attempts and plots. There had already been one close call back on Christmas Eve 1800, when a cart full of explosives had been blown up on the Rue saint Quais in Paris shortly after Napoleon's carriage passed by it. In the first weeks of 1804, a similarly sophisticated plot was uncovered, one which involved General Jean Moreau, and which aimed to ultimately restore the monarchy by placing Louis, Count of Provence, a grandson of King Louis XV of France on the throne. This also involved prominent royalists such as Jean-Charles Pichegru and Georges Cadoudal, while Louis-Antoine de Bourbon, Duke of Anguien, was also implicated in wider conspiracies surrounding it in the spring of 1804. The conspiracy was successfully identified and rooted out before it could take effect, with Donguien arrested and executed speedily in mid-March. He received only a perfunctory trial, and the evidence would seem to suggest that Donguien had been falsely implicated in the conspiracy. Donguien's innocence aside, the entire episode pointed towards the continuing danger of a royalist insurrection within France and the ongoing efforts to restore the Bourbon monarchy, all things which Britain and other foreign powers were perennially willing to encourage and sponsor. It has been widely speculated that Napoleon's decision to make himself Emperor of France was taken in response to the assassination attempts and conspiracies which seemed to constantly swirl around him in the early 1800s. Certainly, this was the drift of a message which the French Senate sent him days after the uncovering of the plot, in which it was stated that new constitutional innovations might be necessary to preserve Napoleon's position and the advance of the revolution. For his part, Napoleon stated on the 28th of March that he did not require any further titles or promotions, but this was a false modesty, which he did not really possess. In reality, Napoleon had been adopting more and more of the trappings of royalty and imperium ever since his confirmation as First Consul for Life in 1802, and was on record as stating that the establishment of a hereditary monarchy might be the best preventative measure against a counter-revolution and the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. This was an interesting slight of intellectual argument. Napoleon was suggesting that the surest way of preventing the restoration of the old monarchy was to establish a Bonapartist monarchy. As contradictory as his argument might have been, many people agreed. And in the late spring of 1804, Requests were received from local administrations across the country for Napoleon to preserve the revolution by making himself undisputed ruler of France. By the early summer, all that remained to be decided was what title he would take. 
Not one for modesty, Napoleon determined to have himself proclaimed as emperor. Although in line with revolutionary principles, he would not be the emperor of France, but the emperor of the French. Napoleon's coronation took place at the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris on the 2nd of December, 1804. It was one of the most formidable acts of political propaganda in modern history. In many ways, it was modeled on the coronation of Charlemagne, the founder of the Carolingian Empire, a millennium earlier in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome on Christmas Day 800. There, Pope Leo III had conferred the title of Emperor of the Romans on the Frankish king, thereby creating the Holy Roman Empire and acknowledging Charlemagne as a spiritual successor to the Roman emperors in Western Europe. Napoleon would seek to mimic this and requested Pope Pius VII to attend the coronation and bestow him with his new titles. On the morning of the ceremony itself, Napoleon set out with his wife Josephine from the Tuileries Palace towards Notre Dame. At the cathedral, he was vested with a lengthy satin white tunic and a mantle of crimson velvet and ermine. Thereafter, Pius crowned Bonaparte with the words, May the Emperor live forever, which Napoleon responded with a vow to preserve the Republic which had just been cast aside in order to crown him as Emperor. The traditional French crown had been destroyed during the Revolution, and so Napoleon was crowned with a new crown termed the Crown of Napoleon, or the Crown of Charlemagne, in yet another reference to the ancient Frankish king. The whole coronation ceremony was a fitting effort to emphasize parallels between Napoleon and Charlemagne. After all, the Frankish king had conquered much of Western and Central Europe, and as time would prove, Bonaparte was determined to do the same and more. Both after his coronation and before it, Napoleon oversaw a series of wide-ranging domestic reforms of French society, economically, socially, politically and culturally. These were designed to capitalize on the period of peace which France had briefly been afforded after the Treaty of Amiens. But even once war returned in 1803, efforts were made to carry on these reform programs across the country. One of the most prominent of these, introduced by Napoleon early in his time in power, both as First Consul and Emperor, was to alter the department system which had been established by the revolutionaries in 1790 as the basis of administering France. At that time, the country had been divided into 83 departments, each of which was governed by a prefect appointed by the Minister of the Interior in Paris. The idea was to decentralize certain powers to the provinces and regions in an effort to make them more self-governing and more efficient. In 1800, Napoleon altered the system, first by adding 20 more departments, and then by implementing a more rigid system where each was divided into arrondissements and communes, these being subdivisions of the departments and urban centers, each of which were headed by sub-prefects and mayors. Elements of this system had been introduced in 1790, but Napoleon further developed the system. It is still in place today as the manner in which France is divided up administratively. One of the most pressing issues for Napoleon to confront in terms of social, economic and political policy in the early 1800s was the position of the Roman Catholic Church in France. The revolutionaries had been extremely opposed to the influence which the Church held across French society and had accordingly stripped the Church of vast amounts of its wealth and power. Yet, for all that, the leaders of the revolution in Paris had been determined to engineer a new atheistic man of reason. A great many French men and women were still very much Roman Catholics, and the anti-Catholic measures promulgated in the 1790s left them disaffected. It was for this reason that Napoleon, who had largely abandoned any form of religious belief himself in his younger years, determined to reconcile with the papacy and the church in the early 1800s. The result, after much negotiation, was the Concordat of 1801, agreed between Bonaparte and Pope Pius VII 
in July of that year. This restored Roman Catholicism as the official religion of France to a considerable extent, though it was not to be a state religion, and Napoleon had greater control over the appointment of bishops and other senior clergy than Rome going forward. With the enshrinement of the Concordat, upwards of 10,000 priests and clerics who had been in exile since the 1790s were able to return home to France. Churches across the country were reopened and the church was allowed to oversee much of the primary education school system across France yet again. Napoleon's government introduced a wide range of economic measures in the first half of the 1800s. When Bonaparte came to power, the country's finances were still in a turbulent state. It was the poor economic situation which, in the 1780s, had led to the revolution in the first place. And while the vast wealth stripping from the church and aristocracy in the 1790s, as well as cash indemnities from France's defeated enemies in the French Revolutionary Wars, had provided the revolutionary regime with financial windfalls, these were not sustainable forms of income. It was in this light that Napoleon and his ministers set about establishing a new efficient taxation system in the early 1800s, based on income and land ownership. This would eventually result in a huge land registry being produced, through which the sizes of individual houses, small holdings and estates throughout France were calculated on the commune level and then taxed according to the wealth of the individual landholders. Through these measures, the tax base of the French state began to increase considerably during the course of the 1800s, though it would never be enough to cover the vast military expenditure incurred by Napoleon. It was also under Napoleon's stewardship of France that the country's national bank came into existence. National banks, stock markets and corporations had first emerged in England and the Dutch Republic in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. But other European nations were remarkably slow to adopt these forms of nascent capitalism. It was the 1710s before a national bank had first been attempted in France, and on that occasion it quickly collapsed owing to the Mississippi bubble, an overly speculative investment concerning French colonization of Louisiana, which was a corollary to the South Sea bubble in England. Accordingly, it was the 1790s before concerted efforts to establish a national bank were entered into again. The result, rubber stamped by Napoleon in 1800, was the creation of the Bank of France. A board of 15 members was appointed in 1803, with considerable powers over French finance, while the bank was the only body in France which was allowed to issue banknotes throughout Napoleon's time as Emperor of the French. Based in the Hotel de Toulouse in Paris, the Bank of France's primary role was not in providing loans to customers, but in providing liquidity to smaller banks around France and its occupied territories, in the process making loans available to French men and women. During the same period, he also reformed the coinage with a system of copper coins worth two, three or five centimes, silver coins of varying values between one quarter of a franc and five francs, and gold coins worth either 10, 20, or 40 francs. Given French dominance of Western Europe by then, the silver one franc coin became the standard unit of trade and commerce in the west of the continent for many years. When it came to agriculture, Napoleon and his government tried to introduce novel ideas. The revolutionary period during the 1790s had already seen a massive amount of land redistribution as the three main landholders, the crown, the aristocracy and the church, had their lands taken from them and redistributed amongst smaller landholders, a development which should have introduced efficiencies in many respects. However, French agriculture and food processing still remained considerably behind other countries with the exception of the wine trade. To combat such backwardness, novel measures were taken. For instance, Napoleon attempted to encourage French farmers to diversify into sugar beet cultivation. At the start of the 19th century, Europe received most of its sugar 
from plantations in the West Indies. With the British dominating the high seas, the French attempted to develop an alternative domestic industry, with Bonaparte eventually decreeing that 32,000 hectares of land should be turned over to the cultivation of beet, with the ultimate goal of mass-producing sucrose. Elsewhere, the emperor's government offered a prize throughout the 1800s to anyone who could devise a method to preserve fresh food for weeks or even months on end. The goal was to do so in order to increase the shelf life of food supplies for the army. The prize was eventually claimed by Nicolas Appert, a confectioner who discovered a method of preserving foodstuffs by slowly heating and boiling fresh food and then storing it in airtight glass jars. In the process, inventing the concept which underlies modern canning. French agriculture and food production ultimately had a long way to go to introduce needed efficiencies, even by the end of Napoleon's reign. But anyone eating sucrose or canned food today can, to a certain extent, either thank or blame the French emperor. An often overlooked matter when it comes to the history of Napoleonic France is the degree to which Bonaparte attempted to encourage industrial investment and growth. The Industrial Revolution had begun in Britain in the 1770s, as a number of technological innovations transformed the textile industry there and the first factories were set up to mass-produce cotton and linen. France, like most of continental Europe, was decades behind Britain at the beginning of the 19th century. Yet Bonaparte was determined to make some inroads in this sector. He had read Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations in translation by the time he was crowned and attempted to put some of its advice into practice to develop the French economy. Chambers of commerce were set up in departments across the country. Money was offered to those seeking to set up businesses while industrial espionage was engaged in whereby French spies were sent to Britain to learn about the new industrial methods and technology being used there. There were some limited successes to this. Marseille developed a thriving soap-making industry, employing over a thousand people, and the French silk industry expanded. But in the main, the distractions of war and the overly protectionist policies of the regime hampered industrial development, and it has been conjectured that by the early 1810s, France's level of industrialization was only on a par with that of Britain's in 1780. Much more successful were Napoleon's infrastructure reforms. As first consul and then as emperor, Napoleon took steps to develop France's roads, sewers and hospitals. A centralized system of healthcare, for instance, was established in Paris, run from the Hotel Dieu in the city, which triaged patients and sent them to other facilities, while there were also efforts to systematically organize the dispensing of drugs used to treat pain and ailments, as rudimentary as they were at the time. As with a great many other things in Napoleonic France, the development of the healthcare system was undertaken with an eye to the military and how wounded soldiers would be treated. Other initiatives were for civilian purposes. Central here, was Napoleon's order to begin developing a sewer system underneath Paris to tackle the waste problem which was native to every major city in Europe by the end of the 18th century. The result was the first vaulted sewer network in the French capital, one which ran for 30 kilometers if stretched out in a straight line. While the city's sewer system today owes more to the second half of the 19th century, it was Bonaparte who made the first efforts at developing it. Finally, Napoleon was instrumental in redeveloping France's road network, eventually issuing a decree in 1811 for the establishment of 14 imperial highways, all beginning at Paris and radiating out from the city to other major urban centers like Calais in the north, Lyon and Marseille in the south, and Bordeaux and Rennes in the west. One of Napoleon's most underappreciated achievements was his contribution to creating a modern educational system in France. In the early summer of 1802, he had begun the process when he passed a law setting up 45 state secondary schools, or lycées, the purpose of which 
was to train a professional cadre of bureaucrats and army officers for the new French state. These were refreshingly egalitarian, with approximately 6,500 scholarships being offered countrywide to facilitate boys from modest backgrounds to attend. The Corsican should also be commended for reopening the Sorbonne, or University of Paris in 1808, which had been closed by the revolutionaries, as well as on his plans to establish an imperial college system which would oversee national education. But in other areas, he was utterly backwards. Napoleon restored the management and implementation of primary school education into the hands of the Roman Catholic Church, a retrograde measure at the start of the century which would witness Europe trying at length to separate the ties between the church and education in many countries. While his views on girls being formally educated can only be described as incredibly backwards, the emperor stating at one time that the role of women was family life and the home. To all of these reforms and measures in the fields of economics, industry, agriculture and education, there was also a wide array of other legislation and acts added. It was Napoleon, for instance, who in 1806 decided that the new revolutionary calendar, which had been introduced in 1793, with its new months and weeks of 10 days, had not been accepted widely enough to be retained and dispensed with it in favor of the old Gregorian calendar. It was also Napoleon who formally adopted the metric system as a universal system of weights and measures. It had been developed during the 1790s under the direction of the First Republic, but it was Bonaparte who adopted it formally. Despite his own reservations about the practicality of the system, it is used throughout the world today. To Napoleon, we might also give some credit for standardizing the French language. France, like all large European countries, was a tapestry of competing dialects and regional variations of a given language in early modern times. Of a total population of 28 million people, millions in France spoke either different languages or dialects, be they Breton, Occitan, Italian, Flemish or Basque. He took measures to begin standardizing modern French as the language of government and administration throughout the country and in doing so established vernacular French as the universal language of the country. As extensive as all of these reforms were, Napoleon is remembered today with respect to his domestic policy and will continue to be so for one particular achievement, the Napoleonic Code of 1804. By the late 18th century, few European states had an established uniform legal system. Instead, they had many overlapping legal codes, which were generally a mix of the Roman civil law, elements of Germanic common law, the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church, and numerous other local influences. Across France, there were over 40 competing law codes, and the revolutionary government had set itself the task in the early 1790s of creating a single uniform law code, one which would ultimately be based on Roman civil law, but updated to take account of modern European society and the ideals of the revolution. The man charged with leading this effort was Jean-Jacques Régis de Combeserre, the second consul of France and Napoleon's junior in the consulate between 1799 and 1804, aided by a committee of leading lawyers and officials. The work was still underway well into the early 1800s, and Napoleon himself attended dozens of the over 100 plenary sessions which were held to debate on matters relating to it. The result, as codified in 1804, was the Civil Code of France, or as it is also known, the Napoleonic Code. The Napoleonic Code simplified thousands of laws and decrees into a single body of laws, establishing clear principles concerning the rights of individuals, their obligations to the state, and how the courts should implement the laws. Many of the rights which it granted to French citizens would have been inconceivable just a century or two earlier. 
For instance, the code established religious tolerance for all, including atheists, while also laying out the principle of a separation of church and state. It enshrined some of the principles of the revolution of 1789 in removing privileges based on one's birth or background, abolishing the feudal system and clearly establishing equality before the law. Frenchmen could engage in whatever occupation they desired, regardless of their background, and could also hold land provided they could purchase it. However, viewed through a modern lens, there were clear issues with the Napoleonic Code. By the standards of the 21st century, it was a deeply patriarchal and sexist document, establishing the father as pater familias as an overly powerful head of families. For instance, adultery for a wife was punishable by up to two years in prison. A husband was subject to a fine. These not inconsiderable issues aside, the Napoleonic Code established new liberties for French people which had not existed for them earlier in their lives, if they were in their thirties, forties or older. It would be applied to many of the territories which France conquered in Western and Central Europe in the years that followed, and it was only in the second half of the 1810s when it was abandoned in countries like Spain and parts of Germany after Napoleon's downfall that many people would realize how many liberties they had actually acquired in the 1800s and then lost after just a few years of French rule. While the enshrinement of the Napoleonic Code in France and beyond in the early years of Bonaparte's rule was the most significant domestic reform of his reign, the most enduring was the creation of France's major museum. As we have seen, the French revolutionary government had pillaged artworks and other cultural material from countries like Italy and the Dutch Republic during the 1790s. Much of this priceless heritage was sitting in various palaces and buildings in Paris by the early 1800s, with individuals within government debating what should be done with them. Napoleon consulted extensively with government ministers on the matter, leading in August 1801 to the Chaptal Decree, named after Jean-Antoine Chaptal the French Minister of the Interior. This established 15 museums in numerous French cities, which would house artworks and cultural works looted from across Europe. Easily, the most well-known museum established to house such works was the Louvre in Paris, a former royal family home which was transformed into Europe's most significant museum from the revolutionary period onwards. It temporarily became known as the Napoleon Museum from 1803 onwards, ten years after it had been first refurbished for such a use. It would be easy today to view this as a cultural looting, pure and simple. But one must remember that those who brought these works to Paris in the 1790s and 1800s were often rescuing them from decades or even centuries of neglect and carrying out conservation and restoration work on them something those who established and ran the Louvre in its early years were anxious to highlight. Certainly, the many visitors who flocked to Paris from all over Europe in the brief period of peace which the continent enjoyed following the Peace of Amiens in order to visit the new museum were benefiting from this dual act of looting and preservation. The establishment of the Louvre set a precedent for other museums such as the British Museum in London and the Prado in Madrid during the 19th century. There are numerous rather unusual features of Napoleon's life during these years which are somewhat shadowy and unknown. One is that the Emperor of the French is believed to have devised a mathematical theorem which has been named in his honor. Napoleon's theorem states that if equilateral triangles triangles with sides of equal length are constructed on the sides of any triangle, either all running outward or inward, these, if they meet, will also form equilateral triangles. This is where you look at an equilateral triangle and there are smaller triangles drawn within it, touching the sides of the larger outer triangle. These inner triangles will always form equilateral triangles as well. Napoleon's triangle emerged in print and became widely known in the mid-1820s, 
and there has consequently been a considerable debate as to what involvement Bonaparte actually had in devising it. But it seems plausible that he was tied to it in some fashion, given that we know that Napoleon had excelled in the study of mathematics in his early days training within France's military schools in the 1780s. It was also in the early 1800s that a project which Napoleon had sponsored some years earlier came to partial fruition. Around 1800, Napoleon had been contacted by an American inventor and engineer by the name of Robert Fulton. He was a man who some years later would build the world's first commercially viable steamboat. In 1800, in France, his primary interest was in building a submarine. To that end, he obtained an interview with Napoleon shortly after he had become First Consul in order to obtain funding and logistical support for his efforts. This resulted in 1801 in the launching of the Nautilus at the port of Le Havre, where Fulton and three crewmen travelled underwater on the prototype to a depth of 25 metres. They remained there with some candles burning for an hour without any major difficulty. Napoleon expressed the desire thereafter to view the Nautilus and see what it could accomplish, but unfortunately, Reports emerged later of difficulties with Fulton's submarine, and the Emperor abandoned his desire to see it, something which may have also been associated with the abandonment of plans for a naval invasion of Britain in subsequent years. It would be decades before a working submarine would be brought into action. It is interesting to speculate what might have happened had Bonaparte continued his interest in and financing for the project. 1804 was a significant year in terms of the restoration of royal, noble and imperial titles. The French Revolution had been initiated and driven with the idea of dispensing of the old order, with its aristocratic titles inherited from the medieval period and the trappings of nobility. Accordingly, the aristocracy had been dismantled in the 1790s. But just as he was preparing to be crowned as Emperor of the French, Bonaparte also began creating a new nobility. As with medieval kings and queens, dispensing titles like baron and earl on their closest supporters, Napoleon was effectively using the creation of a new aristocracy as a means of dispensing patronage to his allies and family members. Consequently, some of his most senior marshals and generals would be rewarded with titles, while after a certain point, it became standard to award government ministers, ambassadors, and other senior officials with titles like Baron and Count. After being followed for four years informally, this system was eventually codified in March 1808, when Napoleon issued a decree concerning what he termed the nobility of empire, the concept that those who were receiving titles were receiving them owing to their service to the state and the French empire. In total, approximately 2,200 such titles would eventually be created. Many of these titles were conferred on individuals who had indeed rendered extensive service to the French state. For instance, Joachim Murat, Napoleon's close military associate and ally ever since the events of 13 Vendemiaire, all the way back in the autumn of 1795, and who had latterly become Napoleon's brother-in-law through his marriage to Caroline Bonaparte, was made a Prince Francais, a Prince of France in 1804. While there is no doubt that Murat was rewarded owing to his personal relationship with Napoleon, he had also served the state well for many years. He would subsequently be made Grand Duke of Berg in 1806, and then King of Naples in 1808. Similarly, Napoleon made Louis-Alexandre Berthier his chief of staff within his military commands for many years and French Minister of War from 1799 onwards, Prince of Neuchâtel and Valangin, in February 1806. Berthier is acknowledged as one of the greatest military administrators in history, and there was every reason to honour him for his service to France. De Combeserre, the architect of the Napoleonic Code, was made a Prince Francais, and in 1808, became Duke of Parma. Whatever the failings of civil code, 
few could argue that de Combeserre had not worked extensively on behalf of the French state for many years in devising it, and if the new nobility of empire was intended to honor its servants, then he was certainly deserving of acknowledgement in this fashion. However, there was a very different side to this new nobility of empire, one which had little to do with service to the state and everything to do with Napoleon's desire to reward his family, in-laws and associates. A great many of the senior most titles within the new nobility of empire were handed out to Bonaparte's family members. His elder brother Joseph was made a Prince Francais in 1804, became King of Naples in 1806, and in 1808 would become King of Spain. Louis Bonaparte, one of the Emperor's younger brothers, would be made King of Holland in 1806, while another sibling, Jerome, also became a monarch in later years. Napoleon made his stepson, Josephine's son from her first marriage, Eugene, Viceroy of Italy in the mid-1800s. His half-uncle on his mother's side, Joseph Fesch, became Bishop of Lyon in 1802 and effectively the French ambassador to the papacy. Several of Napoleon's sisters and female relatives were also granted major titles and honors. All of this was not simply overt nepotism, but eventually came to damage Napoleon's efforts to rule Europe as incompetent siblings and relatives proved unequal to the positions of power to which they were appointed. Ironically, perhaps the most capable of Napoleon's brothers, Lucien, who had played a major role in facilitating the coup of 18 Brumaire, which brought Napoleon to power as first consul in November 1799, was one of the few of his relatives who did not gain from his largesse. Lucien opposed many of Napoleon's policies in the early 1800s, including his decision to make himself emperor. He subsequently refused any titles and instead went into a self-imposed exile, first in Rome and then in Britain. It was not simply in his resurrection of the nobility and his nepotism that Napoleon quickly abandoned many of the ideals of the revolution and readopted the trappings of monarchy. There was also virtually no effort made by Napoleon to distinguish himself from the Bourbon monarchy in terms of his residences and how he lived. The emperor essentially took over the former royal palaces and lived in them. His main abode in Paris was the Tuileries, which had been built by the last of the Valois monarchs in the second half of the 16th century, and which had been the scene of the house arrest of King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette during the early 1790s. Here, all of the vestiges of the medieval and early modern royal courts were resurrected, with liveried guards, servants and hangers-on for every remedial task. Napoleon even had a trenchant to cut his meat when dining. The Chateau de Fontainebleau, built as the finest example of a Renaissance palace in France in the 16th century, was also restored by Napoleon from 1804. Central to many of these efforts was Empress Josephine, whose decadent style and penchant for grandeur became notorious even before Napoleon became first consul. This use of former royal palaces applied to the Palace of Versailles too, the symbol of Bourbon absolutism and aloofness. Although Napoleon did not live here for an extended period of time, and he deemed the repair and renovation of the main palace to be too expensive after over a decade of neglect, he did have the Grand Trianon and Petit Trianon on the Versailles estate refurbished and used as royal residences, notably for his extended family and later for his second wife. Thus, Napoleon surrounded himself with the trappings of the former French monarchy in the royal palaces developed during the 16th and 17th centuries. Yet these trappings aside, Napoleon was no Louis XVI. Whether as first consul or emperor, he worked with the same tireless energy as he had displayed since the days of the siege of Toulon and his first Italian campaign. His role model in this respect was Julius Caesar, who during his brief time as ruler of Rome in the mid-40s BC had overhauled much of the Roman state in ways which shaped Roman history and beyond. Napoleon's daily schedule involved an early lunch 
following which he adjourned to his office for several hours with his secretaries, often dictating dozens of letters in a particularly busy day. These meetings could be taxing as Bonaparte was known to dictate several letters to different secretaries at the same time, often entering a new thought on one incomplete letter before moving on to another. In the afternoon, he met with his senior ministers to discuss various matters. War was often on his mind, but as we have seen, a wide range of domestic policy issues were always under consideration as well. Dinner was served at 6 p.m. to the emperor, but Napoleon was notorious for being late, as he often continued to work in his office. Afterwards, he typically returned to work for several hours. Leisure time was limited, but where it was found, he would read, attend the theatre, or visit one of his mistresses. A perennial presence throughout, of course, was Napoleon's wife, Josephine. When Napoleon was crowned as Emperor of the French in Notre Dame in early December 1804, Josephine had been bestowed with the title of Empress of the French. He had even placed the crown on her head that day, making her only the second woman to be crowned and anointed in French history, a scene which Jacques-Louis David, the great painter of revolutionary and Napoleonic France, captured so well in his painting of the Coronation Day. Yet, this aside, theirs was a complicated marriage. Bonaparte had been besotted with her when first they met in late 1795, and had expressed his love in no uncertain terms for months until they married in March 1796, despite the objections of Napoleon's family, who were bewildered as to why he had chosen a woman six years his senior and with two children from her previous marriage as his partner. His ardor, however, began to dissipate during the course of 1797, while he was on campaign in Italy, when his letters to Josephine went unanswered, and he eventually learned that she was engaged in an affair with a cavalry lieutenant by the name of Hippolyte Charles. Napoleon's response was to decry his relationship with Josephine to some extent, but more broadly, to develop a general antipathy towards women, and from the late 1790s, there was a hardened edge to his already profoundly sexist views. When he was on campaign in Egypt a year later, he began an affair of his own with Pauline Fleur, the wife of one of his junior officers. He made no effort to disguise the affair, and Four was often seen riding around Cairo in Napoleon's carriage with him and hosting events at his residence in the Egyptian capital. Despite their infidelities, Napoleon and Josephine remained married, although he had considered divorce when he initially learned of her affair with Hippolyte in 1798. Now, in the 1800s, their marriage became a more political affair. There is no doubt that despite the betrayals of their marriage, they retained a mutual respect, if not marital love, for one another. But the union was often strained. On one occasion in 1804, shortly before she was crowned as empress and he as emperor, Josephine had walked into the bedroom of one of her ladies-in-waiting, Elizabeth de Vaudet, only to find Napoleon there. She was understandably irate, but it was Napoleon who ended up displaying the greater anger in the end on this occasion, telling Josephine that he intended to divorce her as they had not had children and he needed an heir. On this occasion, the rift was healed after a few days when Josephine's daughter from her first marriage, Hortense, intervened to patch things up. But it was clear that not all was well between the man and woman that were crowned alongside each other at Notre Dame several weeks later. The issue of an heir was central to the declining relationship between Napoleon and Josephine. She was six years his senior, and by the time the coronation took place, she was 41 years of age, and the possibility of her bearing any further children was becoming more and more remote. Napoleon was perturbed by what to do about this, but the fact that he was reluctant to divorce Josephine and marry someone else with whom he might have children almost certainly indicates that he believed that he was sterile. After all, Josephine had two children from her first marriage, whereas Napoleon had none. Thus, it was a shock to Bonaparte when, in the middle of 1806, he learned that his mistress, 
Louise Catherine de la Plaine was pregnant with his child. When a son named Charles Léon was born that December, it raised a major political question. If Napoleon was not sterile, then would he be better off divorcing Josephine and remarrying in the hopes of producing a legitimate heir? In the process, he might also be able to hold out marriage as a powerful bargaining chip in his negotiations with one of Europe's royal houses. For the time being, in the mid-1800s, he decided not to do so. But the issue would re-emerge in years to come. The perception of the French people, and in particular, the people of Paris towards him, was a matter of some significant concern to Napoleon in the 1800s. He tried, where possible, to renormalize life after the tumultuous years of the 1790s. For instance, mass was yet again celebrated in Notre Dame Cathedral, while a more professional policing service was established. He also set about transforming the city into a great capital, conceiving of it as a new Rome and great seat of his empire. To this end, buildings, avenues and monuments such as the Arc de Triomphe, the Rue de Rivoli and the Place Vendôme were built or refurbished during his reign, while other achievements included the erection of the Pont des Arts, the first iron bridge to be set up over the River Seine in Paris. Napoleon didn't take it on faith that this work went down well with Parisians. Instead, he is believed to have occasionally disguised himself as a French peasant and headed out in the evenings to make conversation with the denizens of the capital to get a sense, anonymously, of what they thought of Napoleonic Paris and how he was performing as emperor. Napoleon's marital affairs were not the only relationship which was becoming increasingly strained in the lead-up to Napoleon's decision to become Emperor of France. So too was that between France and Britain. The peace established through the Treaty of Amiens in 1802 had always been a very tenuous one, and new controversies seemed to threaten its abandonment every month. For instance, no sooner had the British removed their troops from the small Italian island of Elba than Napoleon ordered a French occupation of it. This was a small strategic issue, but one which suggested a breach of faith on Bonaparte's behalf concerning an island which he would become famously associated with many years later. Equally, French interference in the internal affairs of the Batavian, Helvetic and Cisalpine republics led to reproaches from London. In retaliation, the British had indicated that they would refuse to hand the Cape Colony in southern Africa back to the Dutch if the French continued with their aggressive actions. Yet all of these were ultimately sideshows. In reality, both the British and the French had entered into the treaty in 1802 in full awareness that it was a temporary ceasefire rather than a lasting basis for peace between the two nations. The only thing which was surprising about Britain's new declaration of war on France on the 18th of May 1803 was that it came as soon as it did. Both Bonaparte in France and the British Prime Minister, Henry Addington, would have hoped for a longer period of peace to prepare for renewed war. In Addington's case, the swift return to war tarnished his negotiation of the Amiens Agreement the previous year and within a year of the recommencement of the conflict, he was replaced by William Pitt the Younger as Prime Minister. The resumption of hostilities with Britain was absolutely critical for the development of a new coalition against the French in the mid-1800s. From when it first went to war with revolutionary France in 1793 until the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, Britain bankrolled Europe's wars against the French. Britain might have been a small nation, with a population only half the size of France's, but it was the wealthiest nation on earth in per capita terms. Affluence, which had been built during the 18th century on the back of overseas trade, the rapid industrialization of England from the 1770s onwards, and the English East India Company's conquest of much of India since the late 1750s. With this wealth, Britain was able to finance the maintenance of a strong royal navy throughout the wars, efforts which robbed France of the ability to dominate the seas as well as the land. The British government and London's mercantile community 
also provided huge loans to countries like Austria, Prussia, and Russia during the course of the wars. For instance, the government in Vienna took out several loans of millions of pounds from England in the mid to late 1790s. The British national government debt ballooned in tandem, but successive governments in London considered this a necessary burden in order to continue the struggle against French efforts to dominate the continent. Thus, British involvement was absolutely central to fighting France during the course of the 1790s and 1800s, and with the resumption of war between the two nations in 1803, the possibility of the building of a new anti-French coalition became acute. While Britain and France were at war again from May 1803, Europe's other major powers were reluctant to return to war with Paris again so quickly. Austria, for instance, was markedly reluctant to go to war again with France. Its involvement in the wars of the First and Second Coalitions had been a disaster for the Austrians, leading to the loss of their territories in the Low Countries in what are now Belgium, Luxembourg and northeastern France, as well as their dominant position in northern Italy, where France had become the uppermost power in the late 1790s. Prussia was also reluctant to return to war against the French and had been so since the mid-1790s, when it had lost influence in the Rhineland during the War of the First Coalition. Finally, Tsar Alexander I was unwilling to unequivocally support the British stance given Britain's desire to limit Russian expansion in the Balkans and Black Sea region at the expense of the Ottoman Empire. Others, such as Spain and Bavaria, were looking to ally with France in any future conflict to benefit their own personal agendas. While Britain and France were at war from the summer of 1803, the wider war of the Third Coalition took until 1805 to fully erupt. Already in 1804, the British government was actively looking for allies. It found one in the shape of Sweden, a power which had been relatively unopposed to France in previous years, but which had broken off diplomatic contacts with Paris following the arrest and execution of the Duke d'Anguillon in the spring of 1804. Sweden subsequently allowed Britain to begin amassing its troops in Pomerania, in what is now northern Germany, but which was then a Swedish territory on the south shores of the Baltic Sea. The Swedes entered the war directly on Britain's side in December 1804. Eventually, in the summer of 1805, the Russians decided to enter the war on Britain and Sweden's side. With this, France's former enemies were emboldened. The Austrians, who had begun to modernize and reform their army after the humiliations of the Italian campaign of 1796 and 1797 and the Battle of Marengo in 1800, rolled the dice and declared war on Napoleon in August 1805, followed by the Kingdom of Naples, the last major independent power in Italy in September. On the other side, Spain, Bavaria and a number of smaller German and Italian states, as well as France's allies amongst the Dutch, joined the French whilst Prussia remained neutral in the war of the Third Coalition. The members of the Third Coalition would face a French army that Napoleon had introduced yet more reforms into. In 1804, he created La Grande Armée, the Great Army, as the central fighting force of the French military. It was formed initially out of the Army of the Ocean Coasts, a fighting force of 100,000 men, which had been preparing for the planned invasion of Britain. But in the year that followed, it was expanded to nearly 200,000 men, divided into six corps, initially of between 20,000 and 30,000 men each headed by some of Napoleon's most trusted marshals. It was better provisioned and trained than virtually any other army in Europe, with perhaps the exception of the Prussian military, which had established itself as the best managed and led army in Europe in the 18th century, but which was suffering from a lack of effective generals in the 1800s, and which could not deploy the same sheer manpower as France. What made La Grande Armée especially distinct from any European army up to that point, 
was the cohesive nature of its staff system, with a clear hierarchy of command from Napoleon and his chief of staff, Marshal Berthier, down through the other marshals, generals, and other staff officers. Smaller units of thousands or hundreds of men were well-trained and rigidly organized, so that when the army moved as a whole, units stayed within arranged distances of each other. Perhaps what characterized this new fighting force most clearly was its use of forced marches to cover long distances in short periods of time. It was this speed and the attendant use of artillery trains and cannons, the use of which Napoleon was so familiar with from his days as an artillery commander, that would make La Grande Armée the most effective fighting force in Europe in the years that followed its formation. Hand in hand with the creation of La Grande Armée in 1804 was Napoleon's creation of the Marshals of the Empire. The title of Mariscalis Francii went back to the late 12th century when King Philip Augustus II of France had created the title and bestowed it on Alberic Clément, his former general. It had been awarded periodically in the centuries since by the French kings to leading generals but was abolished by the revolutionaries in 1793. Now, in May 1804, in line with his resurrecting of the French nobility and title system, Napoleon created the title of Maréchal d'Empire, or Marshal of the Empire, as a title which was to be given to France's most distinguished generals. The title was bestowed on 18 individuals in 1804, though four of these were awarded to those who were either retired or in semi-retirement as an honorary title in recognition of their service. Men such as the 69-year-old Francois Christopher de Quelemont, who was engaged in training reserve forces in France by the mid-1800s. The 14 who were in active service included Berthier, Murat, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, who had fought with Napoleon in Italy and in the Rhineland in the 1790s, Jean Lannes, who had served in Italy and Egypt, Michel Ney, one of the outstanding cavalry commanders of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, and one or two generals who were not closely tied to Napoleon, but who had served with distinction over the years, notably Edouard Mortier, who had led the campaign against the Swiss Confederacy in the late 1790s, and also won several victories in Western Germany. There is no doubt that the marshals of the empire were some of the finest generals of the age, but others less so, and as was usually the case with Napoleon from the mid-1800s onwards, there was a substratum of nepotism to his choices for the award of the honor. A key element of the new war was Napoleon's determination to finally defeat the perennial enemy which he had failed to do so far, Britain. Plans had been drawn up by the revolutionary government in Paris as early as the mid-1790s to invade Britain with many such designs hinging on the idea of invading Ireland first and using it as a staging site for a conquest of Britain. But these had all come to naught. When hostilities recommenced in 1803, Bonaparte became determined to finally launch a direct invasion of England. That it became something of an obsession for him is seen in his reference to Britain as Carthage, the Roman Republic's mortal enemy during its rise to power in the Western Mediterranean in the 3rd century BC, and his decision to put the bio tapestry depicting William of Normandy's conquest of England in 1066 on display in the Louvre in Paris. By late 1803, such an invasion plan was centering on the idea of creating an army of England, which would be comprised of between 120,000 and 200,000 men. Ports along the French side of the English Channel were expanded, and Bonaparte ordered the construction of large barges, which it was intended could be used to erect a continuous sea bridge all the way across the English Channel. Napoleon was sure of the endeavor's eventual success, and even had commemorative coins struck in advance, reading London in 1804 on one side. In London, there was grave concern about these preparations by the French. The governments of Henry Addington and William Pitt in 1803 and 1804 
began investing large amounts of money on the construction of a chain of martello towers along the southern coast of England. These round stone towers were small redoubts from which it was intended small units of men would be able to slow the advance of French landing units in the event of an invasion. In tandem, the Royal Navy endeavoured to limit the operational freedom of the French and Spanish fleets throughout the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean during these invasion preparations, while a raid was undertaken against the French port of Boulogne in October 1804, where much of the French preparations were being carried out. Despite such countermeasures, Napoleon continued his plans, the project being financed by the huge cash injection which the government received through the Louisiana Purchase from the United States government. By 1804, Bonaparte was even preparing a 20,000-strong Irish Legion, which was intended to secure control of the neighbouring island once England and Wales had been conquered. There was just one problem. All of this was reliant on France's naval forces being gathered together and deployed to control the English Channel. No successful landing in southern England could be achieved without this provision, and even as the plans for the land army were advanced into early 1805, much of the French fleet was still in the Mediterranean, a long way away from where it needed to be to effect any invasion. Bonaparte's efforts to bring the French Mediterranean fleet into the Atlantic with the Spanish fleet and head for the English Channel would lead to one of the most famous naval battles in history. By mid-October 1805, the French flotilla under the command of Vice Admiral Pierre-Charles Villeneuve was stationed at the port of Cadiz in southern Spain, along with the Spanish contingent under Admiral Federico Gravina, a Sicilian naval commander in Spanish employ. The pair had managed to gather their ships despite British naval blockades of several ports in the western Mediterranean so that by the late autumn they had 33 ships of the line, the heavy battleship of the age, under their command at Cadiz. They had orders to sail with these westwards through the Straits of Gibraltar and into the Atlantic. Once there, they were to sail for the West Indies, the goal being to draw the Royal Navy towards the Caribbean, under the pretense of launching an attack on the many British colonies there. This done, they were to break off from this target and sail fast for the port of Brest in the Bay of Biscay in western France. Once there, they would join with a second flotilla of French and Spanish ships and head for the English Channel, which they would be able to seize control of for long enough to allow the French invasion plans to be initiated. It was with these orders that Villeneuve led the fleet out of Cadiz on the 18th of October, 1805. Villeneuve and Gravina's opponent in their mission was Admiral Horatio Nelson, the same British naval commander who back in August 1798 had destroyed the French fleet in the Battle of the Nile, leaving Napoleon stranded in Egypt and cut off from France for a time. This time, his mission was to prevent the Franco-Spanish fleet from breaking free of Spanish shores. He was outnumbered slightly, having only 27 ships of the line, when he decided to engage the enemy off the coast of Cape Trafalgar in southwestern Spain on the 21st of October 1805. The Battle of Trafalgar was one of the greatest naval victories ever won. Nelson turned prevailing naval tactical wisdom on its head, which said that ships should line up alongside each other and simply try to outgun the enemy. Instead, he decided to sail his ships directly at the Franco-Spanish lines. Using this method, he broke their fleet into three isolated contingents. The Franco-Spanish vanguard sailed off, ending Villeneuve's numerical superiority in ships and giving Nelson the advantage. The rest was up to superior gunnery on the part of the Royal Navy and greater tactical maneuvering. By the end of the day, 21 of the 33 Franco-Spanish ships had been captured, including Villeneuve and his flagship. Though victory at the Battle of Trafalgar came at a heavy price for Nelson, who was shot by a musket ball and killed shortly before the fighting ended, the British didn't lose a single ship. Napoleon's plans for an invasion of Britain were in ruins. French defeat at Trafalgar and the collapse of the British invasion plans 
were more than compensated for by the victories Napoleon was winning in Central Europe against the other members of the Third Coalition. Following the declaration of war on France by Austria in August 1805, Napoleon quickly began preparing La Grande Armée to campaign eastwards into Germany. What has become known as the Ulm Campaign would be one of the most striking accomplishments in military history. The campaign was based on a new approach by Napoleon. At the height of both the wars of the First and Second Coalition, Bonaparte had campaigned into northern Italy against Austria, and the plain of Lombardy had become the crucible of the conflict between France and Austria. This time, the main clashes would occur in southern Germany, as the Austrians attempted to block the French from striking at Vienna, while France also now had a strong ally in the region in the shape of the Bavarians. However, while Napoleon had decided to concentrate on Germany on this occasion, the Austrian high command were deceived into thinking that the French would once again try to attack through northern Italy and then into the Tyrol towards inner Austria. Consequently, they deployed more men into Italy than they should have. As a result, the Austrians had just over 70,000 men deployed to the Black Forest in southern Germany, while Napoleon headed east into Germany with over 150,000 men in late September 1805. Speed was of the essence in the Ulm campaign for the French. While Napoleon had a massive numerical advantage when he entered Germany in mid-autumn, this would only last a limited period of time before the Russians arrived to reinforce the Austrian positions. And speed was exactly what Napoleon employed in a campaign which foreshadowed many of the techniques employed by successive German armies in the 20th century. While the Austrian commander, General Karl Mack, assembled his troops around Ulm in southern Germany, Napoleon engaged in days of rapid forced marches, bringing some of his troops through neutral Prussian territory in order to bring much of his forces around to the rear of the Austrian position. As Bonaparte's intentions became clear, Mack moved to break out of his own position before he was fully encircled by the French. Days of manoeuvres followed, as the French and Austrians tried to establish the best possible position for their attack. These culminated in mid-October with the Battle of Ulm, a four-day conflict which ranged around the wider Ulm area in southern Germany. Here, Napoleon found himself in the unusual position of vastly outnumbering his enemy, having generally been at a numerical disadvantage in most of his previous battles. Bonaparte was able to deploy 80,000 men at Ulm, with Mack having only half this number under his command. The Battle of Ulm was more of a demolition than a clash of might, with the French encircling the Austrian positions and then gradually moving in closer and closer between the 16th and 19th of October. By the time it was done, several thousand Austrian troops were killed or wounded, but the real damage to the Austrian war effort was in the eventual surrender of Mack with over 25,000 troops to the French on the 19th of October. The French had suffered little over a thousand men killed and wounded. With this, the Austrian front in Germany collapsed and the way was clear for Napoleon to strike directly into Austrian territory. The Ulm campaign was a masterstroke, one in which Napoleon used a forced march and speed to rout the enemy in a matter of weeks. However, it also set a dangerous precedent for the 20th century in demonstrating how the violation of neutral territory, in this case Prussia, could be used to gain a tactical advantage. Soldiers who were with Napoleon during the Ulm campaign may have noticed a strangely idiosyncratic trait of the Emperor of the French. When nervous, Bonaparte tended to sing, and this trait often presented itself on the eve of battle, or as his forces waited to make some strategic move, in this case across southern Germany. However, Napoleon was by all accounts completely tone deaf. As one acquaintance of his from Paris in the early 19th century would put it, quote, he began to hum the air, became distracted, and leaving his seat, marched round the room, keeping time to the song he was singing. In fact, Napoleon's voice was most unmusical 
nor do I think he had any ear for music, for neither on this occasion nor in any of his subsequent attempts at singing could I ever discover what tune it was he was executing. Thus, while Napoleon may have been one of history's great generals, and by the mid-1800s his men in Germany knew this very well, they were also greeted by the spectacle of a tone-deaf emperor singing as he waited for battle to commence. With Max's surrender at Ulm, and with much of the Austrians' remaining forces indisposed in northern Italy, the path was clear for La Grande Armée to strike directly at Vienna. Emperor Francis II of Austria was more than aware of the danger, and his government took the strategic decision to abandon Vienna and head north into Bohemia around the modern-day Czech Republic in order to join forces with the Russian army, which had marched into Central Europe under the command of Tsar Alexander I, after the Russian ruler had decided not to try to engage the French at Ulm. Bonaparte wasted little time in following up on the victory at Ulm. He marched eastwards and, meeting with virtually no resistance, entered Vienna on the 13th of November. A sign of the utter vanquishing of the Austrian forces in southern Germany and Austria in the late autumn and early winter of 1805 was seen the same day, when a force of 4,000 Austrians under Baron Franz Jelasic simply capitulated to the French under Marshal Pierre Augereau at Dornburn, near the eastern edge of Lake Constance. Less than two months after beginning the Ulm campaign, Austria and Vienna were in French hands. While the Ulm campaign was proceeding in Germany, there was a second major front being fought on in Italy, particularly after the Kingdom of Naples joined the Third Coalition in September 1805, a few weeks after Austria declared war on France. While he headed into Central Europe, Napoleon dispatched one of his marshals, General André Massena, to Italy with the Army of Italy, which was upwards of 80,000 men strong. There, they quickly faced the Austrian army under Archduke Charles, a son of Emperor Leopold II, at the Battle of Caldiero on the 30th of October near the city of Verona in the north of the country. Despite being significantly outnumbered, Massena won a considerable victory here, and Charles had to fall back towards western Austria in its aftermath, leaving the French in control of northern Italy. Then, Marshal Laurent de Gouvion saint cyr followed up with a move against the city of Venice, during which he destroyed a small Austrian force of some four and a half thousand men, led by the Prince de Rohan at the Battle of Castelfranco Veneto in late November, effectively ending the Italian campaign in the north of the peninsula. Matters were different further to the south, though. In preparation for war with the French, the King of Naples and Sicily, Ferdinand I, had agreed to allow combined British and Russian expeditionary forces to occupy his lands. Thus, by late 1805, there was a significant Anglo-Russian occupation army there. But the resolution of affairs in southern Italy would have to wait until the strategic situation changed in Germany. To the north in Germany, after losing Vienna to the French, the Austrians under Francis II had realized that they could not engage with Napoleon's forces again until such time as they were reinforced by Tsar Alexander I and his Russian forces. In the meantime, Francis held out the possibility of peace negotiations and an armistice to try to limit Bonaparte's movements. But by late November, it was clear that the Austrians and Russians were intent on continuing the fight in Central Europe, and Napoleon began moving northeast to engage them in Bohemia. Here, he neared the combined Austrian and Russian armies a few kilometers from the city of Bruno, in a place called Austerlitz. Bonaparte had in the region of 72,000 troops and just over 150 field cannon. By way of contrast, the combined Austro-Russian forces had 85,000 soldiers and in excess of 310 field artillery ensuring that the French were at a numerical disadvantage and considerably outgunned. Napoleon, though, was in no mood for avoiding conflict, and as his forces arrayed around a geographical feature called Pratts and Heights on the 1st of December, he deliberately weakened his right flank as bait 
to entice the Austrians and Russians into launching an attack against this position. The Battle of Austerlitz, which occurred on the 2nd of December 1805, and which is often termed the Battle of the Three Emperors owing to the presence of Napoleon, Francis II and Alexander I on the field of battle, was arguably the most significant of Bonaparte's military victories. The feigned weakness on the right flank drew the combined Austrian and Russian forces towards the French position on the Pratzen Heights early on in the battle. When this occurred, Bonaparte directed Marshal Soult's corps against the central lines of the Austro-Russian forces, stating that one sharp blow and the war is over. In tandem, a 7,000-strong cavalry division under Marshal Davu that had been some distance away to the south for several days was called into action by Napoleon to plug the weaknesses in the right flank. As this occurred, Soult's corps managed to smash through the center of the Austro-Russian lines, dividing them and sowing chaos amongst their forces. As their armies broke and withdrew from their positions under what was later described as ceaseless canister fire, the French followed up, capturing thousands of enemy troops. By the time night descended in the evening, the Austrians and Russians had suffered over 15,000 men killed or wounded, with upwards of 20,000 more captured in the rout at the end of the battle. The French had lost a cumulative number of about 9,000 men killed, wounded and captured. While Russia was merely chastened by this defeat, as Francis II abandoned the field of Austerlitz, he must have known that Austrian involvement in the War of the Third Coalition was over. With victory at Austerlitz and with Vienna occupied by the French, Napoleon was in a position to impose punishing peace terms on Austria for the third time in less than a decade. A ceasefire was agreed in the days after the Battle of Austerlitz and the Treaty of Pressburg was quickly agreed and signed on the 26th of December 1805. It was a humiliation for Francis II. The government was forced to relinquish Venice and much of what is now Croatia in Dalmatia and Istria. These were incorporated into the Kingdom of Italy, which Napoleon had made himself ruler of a few months earlier. In Germany, France's allies, Bavaria and Baden, were the major beneficiaries, with the Bavarians in particular receiving the Tyrol region of Western Austria, in the process reducing Austria to a minor power outside of the Balkans. To add insult to injury, the regime in Vienna was forced to pay a war indemnity of 40 million francs to France, a not entirely unwarranted measure, given that the Austrians had declared war on France, not the other way round. All in all, it was a catastrophe for Austria, which had only been at war with Bonaparte for four months as part of the War of the Third Coalition. Defeat of Austria and the Treaty of Pressburg ushered in a period of great change in Germany. For just over a millennium, the greater German region had been loosely confederated together into the Holy Roman Empire, a decentralized political entity comprised of hundreds of duchies, counties, free cities and ecclesiastical states, nominally headed by the Holy Roman Emperor, an office which was bestowed by seven elector states and which had been held almost without interruption by the head of the Austrian Habsburgs since the late medieval period. It was clear by the 18th century, with the rise of the centralized nation state, that the empire was no longer a viable political entity. But it was Napoleon who brought it to an end. In July 1806, he established the Confederation of the Rhine, a union of several dozen of the larger German states. To ensure the compliance of these, Napoleon placed his relatives and allies in control of several of the larger constituent states. His brother Jerome, for instance, was placed in charge of Westphalia in northwestern Germany, while Joachim Murat was charged with administering the Grand Duchy of Berg. In this way, the Confederation of the Rhine was just the latest in a series of French satellite states. Four weeks later, the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved just over a millennium after Charlemagne had created it. Because the dissolution of the empire was a necessary precursor to the subsequent emergence of the German state in the 1870s, 
This particular action of Napoleon's was to have a lasting and critical impact on modern European history. With victory at Austerlitz and the Treaty of Pressburg, the war of the Third Coalition was effectively at an end, with France yet again having emerged victorious from it. Britain, Prussia and Russia now remained the only credible threats to French hegemony in Europe. But there is no doubting Napoleon's ascendancy as the master of Europe at this juncture. He was Emperor of France and King of Italy, with the Low Countries and Western Germany also effectively under French rule. Moreover, numerous second-tier powers had begun to reconcile themselves to French dominance of the continent, notably Spain in the Mediterranean, which was a confirmed ally of France's from the mid-1790s onwards, and Bavaria and Baden in Central Europe. Incredibly, there was more to come, and by the end of the first decade of the 1800s, French power would extend from Lisbon in the west to Warsaw in the east. But this success would bring with it overextension, arrogance, and an excess of nepotism, which would begin to prove to be Napoleon's undoing from 1806 onwards. What do you think of Napoleon's decision to become Emperor of France? Did he betray the spirit of the French Revolution in doing so, or was this simply a rubber stamping of a dispensation which had already been arrived at when he became First Consul in 1799? Please let us know in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.